Easter Sunday here at Central Triad Church 2024. You do not want to miss Easter Sunday. It's going to be a phenomenal time had in the house, and you're going to see some great things happen as we put forth uh, a production uh, showing the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's going to be really powerful that day in a unique way. So make plans to be here. Invite a family member. Invite a friend. We're excited about what God's doing in the house. It's so good to see everybody here in the, in the house in person and those that are watching via our live stream. I want to give a shout out to somebody who's watching this morning. Uh, Miss Pamela, who we were able to meet this past week, said she'd be watching this week. And I just want to say, hello, Miss Pamela. It was great to meet you, and I'm glad that you're tuning in with us today. And to everybody else in the house, again, it's good to see you as well. As you know, Pastor has been preaching a phenomenal series uh, dealing with love. Uh, and he also started out the year with talking about a rise. So as he asked me to speak today, I was like, well, how can I put this together to where it'll kind of be a combination of both and it'll flow with where the Lord's been leading him for the house. And so today I want to talk to you briefly concerning a topic that would be titled, Let Love Arise. Let Love Arise. Now I'm going to be speaking to you today on a verse that I have quoted many times, but to my knowledge I have never taken an actual sermon from this particular set of scriptures and talked about it. Yes, quoted it, but not really dug into uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So before we get started in the sermon, i got to ask this question. How many people like history? <laughs> you may say, why are you asking me if I like history? This ain't history class. Well, I want you, I'm, I'm going to ask that you stick with me here for the first few minutes because I've got to lay a little bit of foundation before I get to where I really feel like the Lord is wanting me to go here at the end of this sermon. So you're going to have to stick with me and see the foundation as it's laid so that you understand why Jesus said what he said in the passage of Scripture we're going to be talking about today. So there may be a little bit of nuts and bolts that takes place to put the foundation and, and to put the scaffolding and everything together, but hang with me, listen to what I'm saying, and you'll see where we're going at the end. So if we will take and put the passage of Scripture that we're going to be reading our text from, which is found in Revelations chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verse 1 through 7. So we're going to start reading this this morning to see where we're going. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined and tested the claims of those who say they are apostles, special messengers, personally chosen representatives of Christ, but are not, and have found them to be liars and imposters. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. And you have not grown weary of being faithful to the truth. But I have this charge against you, that you have left your first love. You have lost the depth of love that you first had for me. Verse 5. So remember the heights from which you have fallen and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking your sinful behavior. Seek God's will and do the works you did at first when you first knew me. Otherwise, I will visit you and remove your lampstand, the church, the congregation, and its impact from its place, unless you repent. Yet you have this to your credit, that you hate the works and corrupt teachings of the Nicolaitans that misled and delude the people, which I also hate. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So we're going to be talking about Revelations chapter 2, those first few verses this morning. And before we dig into what this is talking about and, and to the church of Ephesus, there's a little bit of history, as I said previously, that we've got to talk about. The church of Ephesus was planted by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. 
and then, which is found in Acts 18 talking about this. And, and it was essential, the church was, to the spread of the gospel due to its location within the region. We've got to understand where they were located at that time was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was known for its size. Ephesus was known for its wealth. It was known for its power. It was a major center of travel and commerce in the ancient world. We see that there were three major highways, huge highways, that flowed into the city of Ephesus. So it brought a lot of people into that city at all times. There was a lot of coming and going, a lot of, a lot of hustle and bustle, if you will. And we see that it was situated on the Aegean Sea at the mouth of Caister River. The city was one of the greatest seaports at that time that this was written. As well as it, as I said, had the major transportation hub, a major uh, traffic circle, if you will, for the region that it was known for. The city was not only known for the commerce, but it was also known as an idol worship capital. A lot of that worship was due to the worship of Diana and Artemis in the Greek, if you look at it that way, and its religious practices. You've got to understand that because of this and what was taking place within the city, the church had to have a lot of oomph, if you will, about them. They had to be able to stand when they were birthed and when the church was birthed and began to uh, impact the region. There was a lot of pagan worship, a lot of perversion that was taking place, a lot, of, a lot of persecution and public humiliation of the church because what they were standing for. There were a lot of people there that did not like the gospel of Jesus being taught. They were used to the pagan religious uh, uh, things that were happening within the, uh, the Roman Empire. They were used to uh, worshiping false gods and false idols. They, they were used to all of that, but this Jesus, they didn't want any part of it. It was a new thing. It was something that was spreading, and it was, it was robbing uh, of what they thought the traditions should be and, and the traditions were. We see then on Paul's third missionary journey, which is found somewhere around A.D. 54 uh, to 56, that he spent approximately three years teaching in the city. And when he was teaching during this time, he began to address a lot of these false doctrines and a lot of the pagan worship that was taking place, especially the worship that was a tied to Artemis. So we see here that Paul began to shake things up. He began to really impact the region in which he was ministering and to show this Jesus that a lot of people were shunning that were outside the church. They were like, nah, this is gonna, this is gonna mess us up. This is gonna, and I'll show you how that happened. We see where Paul's teaching and the outward evangelism of the church. Now, this is really big here. We see that the evangelistical team of the church, everybody say the evangelistical team. I think that's unique when you begin to study the history because it wasn't just Paul. Now, you've got to look at the pastoral ship that, that headed up the church of Ephesus throughout its years. You had, and they had some legendary pastors. You had Paul, you had John, you had Apollos, you, you, you had Timothy. There, there were some powerful preachers that went through there at different times to head up the church of Ephesus. But what I think is unique here is when you begin to study the history of the church of Ephesus is that it wasn't just Paul. It wasn't just Timothy, it wasn't just Apollos, it wasn't just John. It was the evangelistical team, if you will, that caused a massive crusade in the region for Jesus. The church was doing something phenomenal. They were about their father's business as we began to study this. And when you look a little bit further, there was such a revival that broke out and people started repenting and there was such a move of public repentance. In other words, it wasn't just hidden on a back street somewhere. No, this was out in the open for everybody to see. There was a public repentance that began to take place that it angered the craftsmen that were creating those idol worship items, if you will, those statues and those uh, magic books and all of that thing. It, it, it made them mad because there was a decline in sales. This Jesus was becoming more popular than their false religion and their false gods. It angered them so much that their sales were going down because of Jesus and because of what this church was accomplishing and what was taking place and the people that were repenting that there was a riot that broke out. Now, can you imagine having such a revival take place that a riot happened because so many people were running away from sin? That's the church that I'm talking about. Their evangelistical department had it moving on. They were rocking and rolling for Jesus and wasn't nothing holding them back. 
The repentance of the Ephesian believers was so strong in their hearts and drove them in such a fashion that it produced a radical, far-reaching transformation that completely altered their way of living. But what's so unique about these believers after they repented, it didn't just alter their way of living. No, it began to influence the very atmosphere where they resided. In other words, their newfound faith and their repentance and their, their infilling of the Spirit and everything that was taking place was so meaningful to them and so powerful to them that it didn't just stay with them on their seat. No, it left the building when they left. And they began to change the atmosphere where they stepped when they left the building. In other words, whether they walked into their house, whether they walked into the, the Walmart of the time, if you will, if they wherever they walked, they were changing the atmosphere because what they had received meant so much to them. We're talking about a church that was powerful. Can I hear someone say powerful? powerful. Mm, they weren't just sitting still. They weren't just fat and sassy and, and allowing God to keep feeding them. No, they began to birth some mighty things where they were residing. They caused a shift, not only in the spiritual, but also in the natural. It wasn't just confined to the house, though no, they changed their natural envi environment as well. They were fervently, they were on fire, they were passionate in their love with Jesus and completely sold out to him. They had no sorrows. They, they had no regrets. They had no reservations for starting this new walk. For them, it was all about who can I reach next? Where can I spread the fire of Jesus? Where can I start this revival? Where, where can God use me to ignite the next individual for Jesus and allow them to tap into their calling, their anointing, and their giftings? It was no longer about them and what they used to be. It was all about Jesus. You know, sometimes you hear people say, you know, you know it's that new babe in Christ mentality. They just got saved. They, they're a little crazy right now. It's that, they're a new babe. It's, it's in Christ. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But then we see that around A.D. 62 that Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians commending them. Listen to what he said. He commended them on their faith, their belief, their trust in God, and on their love. Not only their love for him, uh, uh, talking about Jesus, but their love for one another. They appeared, who? The church appeared to be devout in their faith, strong in their faith. They knew why they believed and what they believed. The Bible talks about when you begin to look through the scriptures and you begin to study through history what the Ephesus church was known for, it says that they were a well-organized church and they were busy at all times spreading the gospel. During the early years, historians described the church that it was a growing church. It was an expanding church and there was a longing within the church to do the will of God. As you see here, as we're studying all these historical points, it sounds like a place you want to go to church. Can I get an amen? amen. We see that uh, it was made up not of uh, only Jews, but it was also made up of Gentiles, which was unique for the day. Jews and Gentiles. They were from several cultures, historians tell us. They were from several nationalities, and they were joined in fellowship. They were joined together. They were working together to further the gospel of Jesus. What a unique church. In the time in which it was birthed and in the time that it was operating, that Jew and Gentile alike from all kinds of cultures, from all kinds of nationalities, from all over the region had come, come together and they had decided to tear down racism. That's a powerful church. There's a lot of people who proclaim Jesus but can't get back past the, where somebody's from. Maybe the color of the skin or maybe the side of the tracks that they live on. But the unique thing about the church of Ephesus was they decided as a group to tear down racism and to tear down things that would divide them because they longed to be in unity one with another. There was a calling that was on the church to change people's lives. The calling that was on them wasn't just for them to have great things happen in their life. No, there was a calling to impact the region. And they bought into this hook, line, and sinker. They wanted everything Jesus had to offer. 
and they wanted to do it together. Not only did they want to do it together, they wanted to do it in unison with what Jesus was asking them to do. What a powerful thing. We see that Paul wrote to them in, in Ephesians 1.15. We see that he says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. I have heard of your faith. Man, that's pretty crazy that here one of the, the major apostles of the New Testament who wrote, good Lord, so much of it. And their, their faith at the church of Ephesus was so strong that when he wrote them the letter, he said, I have heard. It's gotten through the grapevine. It's being spread abroad of your faith and how powerful it is in the Lord Jesus. And also, not only your faith, but your love towards all. Everybody say all. All, all saints, not just certain ones but everybody you love everybody and Paul says I, I, I man that is just crazy and then we see again in Ephesians 2 15 he writes and says and how everyone has come together to form one new man one body we see in Ephesians 2 16 where they came together one body so now we see that they're one body they're one mind they were a multi-ethnic as well as diverse in their socio-economic makeup it didn't matter whether you rode in on the latest camel edition or if you were wearing flip-flops that were wore off and done lost the flop. <laughs> they were still together. It didn't matter what you looked like, where you came from. We are still together. It doesn't matter whether your little hut had an upstairs or didn't have an upstairs. We're still together making up one body. Paul commends the church in Ephesians 6, 24 on their sincerity their seriousness, their, their commitment of what that they were, they were living in and their faithfulness. In the final sentence of this letter, in Ephesians 6, 24, he writes this, Grace be with all those. He's talking about all these people. Grace be with all those who love our Lord, Jesus Christ, with undying and incorruptible love. So here he's talking to a church that he's complimented. He, he's commending how good they are, how much they're doing things together, how much they love the Lord. And he also is making known that they are serving God and loving God with an undying, incorruptible love. Now you've got to jump in and you've got to see what this love is that, that he's talking about. And we see that this love comes from Strong's uh, number 25 word, which is agapal. Agape love, which means to prefer to love. <laughs> so this is the love that he was commending the church of Ephesus on. They had a love that they preferred to love. That can be difficult because not everybody's lovable. <sighs> Have you ever met, some, met somebody who's hard to love? Do not look at your neighbor, your spouse, or your friend, or don't look, no, don't do that. Everybody do like this right here. There's some people that ain't easy to love. But they preferred to love. They chose to love. It's an action. It's an action or a choice to love. That means you can love or not love. The choice is yours. For the believer, it means, that's for all of us, it means when you begin to look at the definition, that those are preferring to live their life through Christ. They made a choice to live their life through Christ. They made a choice to embrace God's will. They made a choice to choose his choices. They made a choice to actively choose to do what the Lord prefers, not what they wanted. They made a choice to live life led by his direction and sustained by his power. What a powerful church. Again, this church was moving, and this is what was to their credit. When you begin to look at the love that Paul is talking about here, all of these things, they made the right choices, they loved the right way, they sought after God with everything in them, and they wanted nothing but his direction and his power to be active in their life. What a powerful love. This was the church of Ephesus mentality. The Lord had complimentary points that he wanted to write down for the church of Ephesus when we jump back into Revelation chapter 2. We see where he writes to them and he says, I have seen your hard work. I have seen your patience. Now that right there alone is a phenomenal thing because patience is patience hard for anybody in the house. If I could hold up both feet at one time, I would. Patience is difficult for me. 
But he says, I have seen your hard work, Ephesus. I, I have seen your patience. I have seen your endurance. I've seen your will to run when sometimes it's hard to run. I, I've seen you keep going when you want to quit. I've seen your endurance, church. I know you don't tolerate evil people. I know that you have examined and tried the spirits and tested the claims of those who say they are apostles, special messengers, and personally chosen representatives of Christ, but are not. And through discernment, so they have gifting. They have giftings. So through discernment, they have found them to be liars and imposters. You have patiently, there's that word again, you have patiently suffered. So you've went through hard times, church, and I know this. I know that there were people making a, a public mockery of you, and there were people humiliating you, and there were people that were making fun of this gospel that you're trying to spread. There, I know that you had a hard time, but you patiently endured and patiently suffered for me without quitting. Even though the road was not easy and even though maybe there were a prayers one or two that wasn't answered and maybe things didn't go exact, exactly the way that you wanted them to go and maybe the church wasn't rolling just like you wanted it to roll and maybe the choir didn't sing the song that you wanted to sing nor did the pastor preach what you wanted him to preach but you didn't quit on me. No, you did not grow weary of being faithful to the truth. You did not grow weary to what has been written. You did not go weary of what the Bible and, and the doctrine at that time was teaching. Can I tell you right now, that, that right there is phenomenal in itself because we have so many people that are on shaky ground right now. We have so many people that are altering what the Bible says and what the Word of God says. And there are so many people that are giving in to things that are not written. There are so many people that are allowing their vision to be tainted because of what someone beside them is saying needs to be the new norm. The good thing about the church of Ephesus is they stayed true without quitting to what had been written. They didn't allow themselves to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. This was a powerful statement for the church of Ephesus. He says, you have this also to your credit, that you hate the works and the corrupt teachings of the Nicolaitans. There's a whole Bible study just on, the, just on those individuals alone. How they misled and destroyed the people's faith through control, commercialism of Jesus. In other words, they were selling Jesus to make a dollar. They were doing things. They had turned the, the church into a place of commerce, into a place of saving souls. They had turned the church into a place of entertainment instead of, a, instead of allowing the people to come in and to get saved and experience what they had experienced. No, no he said, hey, you have done these things and you hate this. You hate the, the acceptance of pagan beliefs, which I also hate. What a powerful church that we see here as we see Paul talking to the, the church of Ephesus, telling them all of these things, and we see John in Revelations talking about this as he's giving them all of these compliments that we just read. But then comes Revelations chapter 2, verse 4, and it says this. He says, I have this charge against you that you have left, that you have abandoned, that you have forsaken your first love, your early love, you have lost that depth of love that you first had for me. Now, we just talked about a church that had all of these accolades. We talked about how powerful they were in their prayer and, and in their preaching and, and their evangelism. We, we see how powerful they were in, in allowing other people to come in from other cultures and other nationalities. We see how they were focused on Jesus and they were, they were making sure that there were no wolves that were going to get into the, the body. They were making sure they had built fences to protect the body and they were making sure that everything was running right. We see where Paul had talked about how they had this love, this amazing love to prefer to choose Jesus instead of everything else that made them happy or that would be easy to deal with. No, they chose Jesus in spite of. We see all of these things, but now we have this word. We see this word here. He says, but you've left your first love. So now we're dealing with agape, which actually comes from agapao. And we see where, where agape is talking about an affectionate kind of love. It's a, it's a love of goodwill. It's a love of longing for something and not being satisfied until you get it. It's a, it's a love of taking pleasure in something, being in the presence of something or someone. It's, it's that kind of love. It's an it's a unconditional love. It's a sacrificial love. 
And the last word, which we'll get into in a moment, is it's a love that's a love feast or a love meal type of love. But when you begin to look at this and you see where Jesus points out here in Revelations 2, 4, you, you, you had all of those other things that we listed just a moment ago. You've done this and you've done that and you've done this and, and you, you've accomplished great things. But there's one thing that I have against you. You've lost your affection for me. You've lost your longing for me. You've lost your pleasure that you find when you're with me. You've made things conditional now when it comes to the love of me. You're no longer sacrificing for me so that we can be in unity. No, it's become all about the works. Your love for me has been based on what you are able to do, what not what I am able to do. Your love for me has now been that you have the testimony of keeping out the evil things and you have chosen the right things and you now are allowing people to come and worship and it's almost become prideful, Church of Ephesus. Yes, you've done all of these great things and things that have to be done, but, but I need you to connect to me. I need you to want me as bad as you want the law that you're teaching. I want you to want me as bad as you want to be seen. I want you to want me as bad as you want people to know how good you are. Jesus uses the term agape love in this passage to remind the church of Ephesus of the awe that they had for him at one time, of the appreciation that they had for him at one time, the irresistibility that burned within them to be in the presence of their Savior. He was making it personal to get the point across that you used to give everything you had for me. It wasn't just based on your work. No, you were willing to sacrifice of yourself. You were willing to find that personal time, that sacred place with me. You were willing to seek after me. You were willing to long for me. You were willing to make that relationship that needed to be made. But now, it's all about the works. It's no longer what, what you experienced when you were first awakened or what you first experienced when you received me in your life as a Savior so many years earlier. No, he made this statement found in Revelations 2.4. He made it personal for a reason. He wanted them to know, I see you where you are. I know who you are. You can't cover up who you really are when you show up at church on Sunday morning. You can't shut them. You can't cover up that we never spend time together, Church of Ephesus. You can't cover up who you really are. I see you and I have this against you. Jesus wanted to show them what you're doing is great, but there's some things that are missing and have changed. There's something that's different in the relationship between you and I. I've heard it preached of how the other attributes that we just talked about and that we read, how that those are really, you know, they're, they're great, but, but really the church just totally messed up. And that wasn't really important what they were doing. Well, I'm here to disagree with that this morning. The Lord never told the Ephesian church to stop what they were doing. He never told them to stop the works. He, matter of fact, told them they were doing a good work. And when you look at history, you see all the lives that were impacted and how a region changed because they were listening to the voice of God. That was not the problem. But the problem was that everything had gotten out of balance. Their love and their works, their kingdom work and their kingdom relationship had gotten out of balance. Things had shifted. Things had altered. It had become more about them and what they could accomplish than it was about what the Spirit of God was wanting to do at the time. God is wanting the church to know, without you, you are not. Without me, you are nothing. Without me, your anointing means nothing. Without me, your gifting means nothing. Without me, the waters are never troubled. But with me, great things can happen. But the church of Ephesus had forgotten that. They had gotten to the point to where it had been a place where they were coming together and they were moving the, the kingdom forward and they were talking about Jesus, but they were never communicating with him. Matter of fact, it shows there when you begin to study history that they even had schisms amongst themselves. The church that allowed everybody to come in, the church that loved everybody, the church who when it was born began to demolish racism at the time, that powerful church 
now got to the point that they could no longer operate together in oneness. What they are doing is needful. What they were doing was needful. But we must understand that a healthy church and a healthy follower of Christ is only complete when both aspects of servanthood are in action. We've got to understand that the outer court ministry and the inner court ministry must work hand in hand. What takes to move the kingdom forward must be active, and it is needful. But the relationship part of it between us and God and between you and the person that's sitting on the seat beside of you is also just as needful. This can never be forgotten. God wants to make sure that these attributes align and that they're never in battle with one another. We can't get so lost in the works that we forget about the love. And we can't get so lost in the love that we forget about the works. God said it takes both to make the church go forward. At Ephesus, this is what you forgot. The relational peace. The relational peace had gone lacking. The love feast portion, the, the love meal, if you will, had gone, portion, had gone missing. Those moments of connection with the Messiah as well as one another. That's what you're missing. Those intimate love meal moments where you come together in unity, where you come together appreciating one another, where you come together encouraging one another, where you come together singing and praying and studying, but most of all, being rooted and grounded in the presence of Jesus. That's what you're missing. That's what you're missing, church. Those moments of devotion and study that keeps the manna of the Word of God fresh and palatable. That's what you're missing, church. That's what I'm asking you, Ephesus, to go back to. That's what I'm encouraging you to grab a hold of. It's not that you're bad people. It's not that you're horrible. But I need you to get back into my presence. I need you to grab back a hold of where we used to talk, where we used to meet, where we used to have relationship one with another. That's what I'm longing for, church. Those moments, those love feast moments, those love meal moments where we come together, where we strengthen one another, and we become mature as believers, where we increase our knowledge and understanding of who he is and what he's called us to be and to do. That moment that brings about accountability into our lives. Can I tell you, with no accountability, you are set up for failure. If there's no accountability in your life, you are running as a wild bronco who's running across the mountainside and no one or nothing will be able to tame you. But once you connect yourself with the Spirit of God and the body of Christ, now you've got somebody that can help you in your moments where you need somebody to hold your arms up and somebody to speak life into you. And not only that, now you're connected to somebody who can look at you and say, boy, you better back it up because you done went wrong. The church of Ephesus had gotten to the point where they were missing out of those moments, those love feast moments. So now you have everybody doing whatever they want to do, and they're doing it in the name of Jesus. They're still pushing the kingdom. There's a lot of people still pushing the kingdom, but wouldn't it be terrible to push the kingdom your whole life, and then all of a sudden you wind up in front of your Savior, and he looks at you and says, Depart from me, ye that worked iniquity, because I never knew you. You cast out devils. You healed the sick. You prophesied. But we were not in relationship. We're not in relationship, church of Ephesus. And that's what I'm longing for. Those moments where I can strengthen you. Those moments where I can mature you. Those moments that I can place something inside of you that's going to birth the next revival. That's what I'm longing for, church. Those moments where we break bread both naturally and spiritually. Those moments of worship and of love between you and I in the presence. Mm. See, it was those moments. It was those moments, that one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, that teaching moment, that, that breaking bread moment that gave the disciples the fortitude, the umph, the, uh, the audacity, 
to stand in the face of persecution. They gave them the ability to look at them and say, I'm not backing down and I'm not turning around. That ability that they had within them, that they were willing to give up their life for the expression of the gospel and the moving of the gospel forward, it was those moments that gave them the ability to stand in the fire and begin to proclaim and to prophesy what says the Lord, even though it cost them. It's that one-on-one time that caused the church to be birthed in the Acts chapter 2. It's that one-on-one time that caused the church to expand from town to town and town to town. It's that one-on-one time that made it able, made it able for all of us to sit here today. It's that love feast moment, that one-on-one moment with Jesus and with those around him. We see by the time the apostle John had his revelation, his vision in Revelation chapter 2, which is decades that had passed since the Ephesian church had, had first repented and had been birthed. We see in this vision that Christ used this stern warning. Your, your love, the first one. You have left. You have left. I, I sat there and as I studied this the past week, and when I first read it, I was like, you know what? He was probably teetotally ticked off. Kind of like your mama telling you, you were supposed to be home on time. That kind of anger. But then I began to look at it. That first one, that, that love that we had, you have left it. You've walked away from it. You've walked away from me. After everything that we had, after everything that we were connected doing, you walked away from me. The Greek word for that denotes that you voluntarily released our relationship. You voluntarily did what you've done, Church of Ephesus. You've disregarded where we've been and what we've been through. You've neglected this relationship. You, you forsook this relationship and you've longed for separation from what you once held dear, what you once looked at as having value. You've walked away. You walked away. I began to look at that and I was like, oh my God. What have I done in my life that we accomplished the Lord and I? And then all of a sudden he looks at Dave and says, Dave, you have voluntarily released certain points of my relationship with you. David said it like this, oh, Lord, search me. How many moments do we have a search me, oh, Lord, created me a clean heart? Search me. Search me. This is what Jesus was wanting the church of Ephesus to do. And he loved them so much that he said, all you got to do is turn back to me. All you got to do is repent. All you got to do is connect with me. And everything will be good. Connect with me. Although the Ephesian church was still committed to Christ, doing everything for his name's sake and the protection of the house, They no longer had that deep passion, that fervency for him that they once consumed their hearts. Over the years, as they become more churched, their simple but passionate first love for Jesus had dissipated and it had slipped away from them. It wasn't all at once. You can see as you study throughout history, there was decades that went by, and then there was a little bit, and then there was a little bit, and then there was a little bit, until we arrived at the Revelations chapter 2 moment. Can I tell you, the enemy's not going to just knock you upside the face and cause you to walk away just in one fell swoop most of the time. No, it's going to be a slow fade. And all of a sudden, you're going to look around and say, how did I get to this point? Oh, but if I just keep going to church, everything will be all right. If I just keep going through the motion, everything going to be all right. But there's still a slow fade that's taking place. 
It seems after the years, the church had been fighting spiritual battles. Those year after years, testing false apostles and training leaders and starting new churches and overseeing churches uh, and other groups and dealing with spiritual wolves that had came in to try to ravage the ministry. Keeping up with the day-to-day church business, the Ephesian congregation became focused on protecting and working to the point that they no longer had the the opportunity to enjoy the relationship that they just had some years before. When reading this text, we see that there was still a remarkable church, but a spiritual fervency, the fire that had characterized this body of believers no longer was burning as it once was. They had lost sight of the why. They had lost sight of why they started the journey to begin with. They had lost the reason for the origination of their love for the Savior. They had lost the what that made them want to serve him to begin with. This is why Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flames, to rekindle, to keep ablaze the gift of God which is in you. <laughs> Timothy, you've got to rekindle it. You've got to keep it ablaze. You've got to understand when Paul was writing this, he was writing to a young pastor, a pastor who he knew his family legacy. He knew what his grandma had done, and he knew what the rest of the family was accomplishing, and and he also knew where he found Timothy. He reminds him, son, I know where I brought you from. And I want you to also know, he begins to tell this young pastor, I constantly pray for you. I pray for you day and night. Why do I pray for you, Timothy? That you do not not get so caught up in this life and your personal agenda that you forget your holy calling. He said, I pray for you so you do not become blinded by your own ambitions that you forget why I actually placed you in the kingdom to begin with. He says, don't become so box-driven. I don't know about you, but I'm a very box-driven individual. I'll take and whip out a notepad, and I'll start putting boxes through it all the time of what I've got to do and what I've got to accomplish. But God is wanting to remind someone here this morning, don't become so box-driven. Went to church, went to a C group, paid my tithes, showed up at the work day. I I helped park cars. I I greeted people in the front foyer. I worked Grand Central. I worked Central Kids. I even brought the pastor some water. Check, check, check. Get a couple checks for that one. I made sure everything was good to go. I even vacuumed. I I even picked up some toilet paper that was laying in the bathroom floor because I didn't want the visitor to see it that was getting ready to walk in. Check. Today was a good Sunday. Sunday. And the whole time, God's saying, I love what you're doing. Those things were needful. But did you lift your hands and surrender to me? Did you allow me to move in your realm? Did you allow me to move on you today? Did you allow me to change up the agenda? Did you allow me to rock your world? Did you take your hands off and release your control and say, God, your will, not mine? Timothy, don't allow your pride to dictate your walk. Don't reside, Timothy, in the outer court of work. No, 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 Timothy. Timothy, you've got to understand that it's in his presence, the inner court of sacrifice where atmospheres begin to shift. You've got to understand that it's in his secret place, in his presence where dreams and visions are revealed. It's in his presence where those things that are lost are restored. It's in his presence where old things pass away and new things are created. It's in his presence where mountains are moved. It's in his presence where crooked paths are made straight. It's in his presence where gifting and anointing is revealed. It's in his presence. Timothy, fan the flame. Fan the flame. Don't you stop, Timothy. You fan the flame. 
Son, there's going to be distractions. Fan the flame. There's going to be days you want to quit. Fan the flame. There's going to be days where you're tired of going through what you're going through. Fan the flame. There's going to be days that you get angry. Fan the flame. There's going to be days that you can't carry the load. Fan the flame. God's telling somebody in this house today, you fan the flame. You fan the flame. You fan the flame. You fan the flame. Now's not the time to quit. Fan the flame. Fan the flame. Fan the flame. Fan the flame. When you look that up, when you look that up and see what it actually means in the Greek, it, 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 it's getting down. And it's taking that, those smoldering embers that are sitting there in front of you. And it's saying, get you a poking rod, a poking stick, and you poke it a little bit. And you make some tunnels up underneath there. And then it says you get down and dirty with it. You get up close and personal. And you start blowing. <sighs> And you may say, what do you blow it on that fire? I'm prophesying to that fire that's dying out. You shall live. You shall live and not die. My God, grab a hold of that. With everything in me, blow! Some of you are one breath away, one breath away from everything you thought the enemy stole from you. You're one breath away. Blow! I understand life is tough. I experienced something last year I never thought I'd experience. Sitting on the sidelines. Sitting on the sidelines. I wasn't just mad. I was at a different level of mad. And you can fill in whatever adjective you want to put there that represents mad. That's where I was. A lot of them I can't say up here. I was ticked. Why, God, have you set my butt on the sidelines for a year? 
Why did you rob me at 50 years old? Of, I ain't got a lot of years left to minister. Why did you rob me? Why did you send me? And God reminded me, you got to reconnect me, son. You've been busy. You've been busy. You checking boxes all day long. You busy. But I need you to get in relationship with me. I need you to blow on the flames, son. I need you to remember where I found you. I need you to remember that feeling when you were a 17-year-old boy and I filled you with the Holy Ghost. I need you to remember that. And he told me, blow. Blow. What a youth felt like has robbed you is only setting you up for your future. I want somebody to know right now where you are is not your demise. Where you are is not your ending, but it's setting you up. If you repent and blow for a future you never imagined. God doesn't allow the enemy to rob you of one thing that he does not give back to you seven times over. Somebody needs to grab a hold of that. We got to repent, we got to renew, and we got to revive. Matter of fact, Amos said it like this. Stir up those who are at ease. Those who are relaxed in the church. Shake yourself. Amos said, shake yourself. Don't become weary in well-doing. But Joel puts it in more of a perspective. Joel said it like this. Blow the trumpet in my church, in my gathering place. Blow the trumpet. Sound the alarm to my people. Blow the trumpet! God wants somebody to know in this house you have not gone too far that he doesn't know where you are. We all go through times like the church of Ephesus did. We all go through times where we get so involved in working and so involved in doing good things and so involved in dealing with life and marriages and kids and all of this other stuff that sometimes we forget what the main thing is and sometimes we forget to fan the flames. But I want somebody to know how <laughs> shook I want somebody to know in this house this morning, just like the Spirit of the Lord told the church of Ephesus, if you'll just repent and come back to me, if you'll just repent and come back to me, I'll let your light keep shining. I'll leave the candlestick where it's at. I'll not remove, remove you from my kingdom, but I need you to repent. I need you to change your way of thinking. I need to transform your mind. I need you to get back connected to me. God 
telling somebody in this house this morning, reconnect! Reconnect! It's not too late! You're still gifted. You're still anointed. Reconnect! Fan the flames. Show me that picture. Stephanie, I know I'm taking you backwards. God doesn't want you what's on the right. That is not what you were designed to be. What you were designed to be is a blazing inferno in the kingdom of God. Impacting everybody you come in contact with. Changing your world. Changing your atmosphere. That's you. When you get up in the morning, I need you to see that, not that. When the storms of life blow, see that, not that. Now I'm getting ready to do something crazy. And I know a 210 pound dude laying on a, on a platform blowing in the middle of the air looks stupid to some people. But if you want something bad enough, you'll do the craziest of things to get in touch with God. The question is, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want that fresh fire? How bad do you want that new babe in Christ mentality? How bad do you want to feel those goosebumps on top of goosebumps again? How how bad do you want to pray in your prayer language that you may have not prayed in in 15 years? How bad do you want it? If you want it that bad, if you want it bad enough, there'll be somebody that'll run to this altar, not because you sinned, not because you're some bad person. No, somebody will run to this altar and begin to... If that's you, I invite you to this altar. Everybody who wants to be recommitted. Find you a place around this building. Recommit. Recommit. Recommit.
There's room at this altar, and I feel strongly that somebody's holding back because you think that God won't rekindle your flame. I'm telling you right now, that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is Satan whispered in your ear, and all it's going to take is you stepping out of your seat. All it's going to take is you making your way to this altar and begin to blow on that flame. And I dare you to step out in faith and watch what God's going to do. Watch what God's going to do. But you've got to fan the flame. 